Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator from Rolling Stone, Peter Travers, and tonight's guests, David Gordon Green and Nicholas Cage. Hello. Okay, so how did you two guys get together in the first place to make this? Um, I wrote uh, Nicholas a letter when we, were, we started uh, kind of contemplating who would be good in, uh, in taking on this figurative character of, of, of in my mind, of, uh, of contemporary Southern literature. Larry, uh, Larry Brown had written this novel, this great novel. Um, very complicated character. Um, uh, a number of very specific attributes, and the only person I could think of that really f fit all those qualities was Nicolas Cage. So uh, I wrote him a letter citing, um, you know, my enthusiasm for him and, and, and the inspiration I've had through my career watching his work. Uh, and it was kind of amazing, you know, in, in my position, a, a director trying to uh, entice an actor into a role can be a very long process, can be a very frustrating road of um, a lot of paperwork and letters and phone calls to agents and all this stuff. So about three days later, I got a, a, a voicemail message that I saved on my phone where it's like, this is Nicholas Cage. I read your script, and then I read the book twice. Let's talk. So I called him up, and, um, and literally the next day, he was on a plane, came down to Austin, Texas, where I wanted to film, and um, just immediately started uh, giving birth to this character. See, people, it's that simple. <laughs> Start writing to Nicholas now. I took a the better part of a year off and was looking for a script that would give me an opportunity to uh, express some of the wisdom, emotional wisdom I had learned from some of my so-called mistakes two years leading up to reading Joe. And when I read the script, I knew right away that I understood the guy and understood the dialogue and that this was going to be something where I could perform in a way where I wasn't putting things on top of it, but taking things off of it, being as emotionally naked as I could possibly be. So I, I wanted to get with David ASAP, and I flew out to Austin, really wanted to show him in person how enthusiastic I was about this, that I, I really believed in this. I'd seen his movie Undertow with Josh Lucas, which I thought was extraordinary, and that was a great performance. And Snow Angels with Sam Rockwell, another great performance. And so I... I knew that this was a filmmaker that was going to enable me to dig deep and to be as truthful as I could be. So I was very thankful when it finally came together. Well, we've only seen the trailer here tonight. So can you both explain a little bit about who Joe is? I, mean, I think Joe is a man who has wrestled with his temper and has gotten himself into trouble with the law as a result of his temper, but he's also a man with a moral compass. And even though what he might erupt into may not be right, you can kind of understand it. But at the point where we meet him, he's trying to stay out of trouble. He may drink at home, you know, but he's, he's on point, he goes to work, he's got his crew with him, but he, uh, he doesn't want anything to get in the way of that restraint he's trying to practice. And when he meets Ty Sheridan's character, Gary, he also meets uh, Gary's father, played beautifully by Gary Poulter, and that starts to awaken another aspect, the other side he's been trying to keep in check. But even though it is outside the law, you kind of understand the ethics in his mind about what it is. You agree? I agree. Wow, I knew that was going to happen. That was it. Talk a little, if you would, about the fact that you use people in this movie that don't have a SAG card, that <laughs> basically these are non-pros. Yeah, there's, um, outside of um, Nick and Ty and, uh, and a few uh, actors that I, that I found locally that had performance experience, there was a substantial amount of the, the cast in this project that um, were non-traditional performers. We'd find them in, in pretty outrageous places sometimes. Um, you know, the, the sheriff in the film is my next door neighbor. Not that outrageous, but he's cool. Uh, and uh, who else? A lot of the, the work crew that works with Joe were day laborers we got downtown. Um, uh, one, the foreman of his work crew uh, is this crazy shit talker that, uh, that runs the barbecue restaurant that I go to. And, uh, and, and the, probably the third lead in the film was a gentleman that was, uh, was met by my casting directors at a bus stop and just had a face and they started talking to him and he had a 
beautiful voice and a beautiful story, and he brought him into audition for for one of the smaller bit parts in the movie, and um, and I just started talking to him after that audition. And, you know, he na nailed that role, and I was happy to present him with that. But I said, why don't you come back after learning a little bit about this actor, um, Gary Poulter? I said, why don't you come back and read for the the third lead in the movie? And so he went away for a few days and and came back and. Um, uh, really, really brought some electricity to this role, to the idea of um, how to cast this role. He just started to inform the character to us, knowing knowing far more about the role than anyone that's read the book or or or, or brings the imagination to it. He brings the reality to it. So we were really fortunate to to surround ourselves with uh, performers that brought significant authenticity to these roles. And Gary passed away before he could see the movie. Yeah, shortly after we wrapped, um, yeah, he passed away and did not did not get to see uh, his work that I know he would have been really proud of. You know, we met him at a time, uh, a very hopeful but vulnerable time in his life where he was looking to, you know, get his act together and, and uh, try to get, you know, walking down a, a little bit of a straighter path uh, as a man that's taken a few detours in life. And, uh, and, and we just met him at this really positive moment um, where he was... Uh, celebrating the opportunity, uh, really creating, u using his creative powers to 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 really better himself, uh, rather than some of the more self-destructive qualities of himself. And so he unfortunately didn't make it to to see the work, to see how people have really embraced him. But it's been it's been wonderful just over the last few days, even just seeing how uh, audiences we've been presenting the movie to, and and people have been writing about Gary and really. Um, bringing those positive attributes of, of, of a very tremendous actor. Well, he's extraordinary, but how is it working with him? How is it for you? Uh, I, was, I was thrilled with the opportunity to, to explore a, a new process. I mean, I, I had never been in a situation like that before, but I knew I was in safe hands with David and that he was the kind of director that had the guts and the confidence to, to go outside the box and find someone literally off the street and give him a chance but Gary Poulter was on point he 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 knew his his lines he he was on time and for me it was like th this is a chance to find something new together the the thing is i remember one day cuz I, I i loved his face he had this uh, face that looked like a civil war captain or like richard farnsworth like a, he could have been a cowboy and and I said, you know, Gary, I would just keep it together for one year, just one year, and your phone is going to start ringing, your life is going to change. And he took about a, a minute before he responded. He's big, sad eyes, blue eyes, and he looked at me and went, really? And it was just, ah. Oh. And then I got the call two months after we wrapped that he had passed on, so naturally I was upset. I do want to, we, we've been doing a lot of press, and we've been talking a lot about the guys in the movie, but... There's also a terrific actress named Adrian Mishler, and she, she came out to New York, and I wanted to take a picture with her so people could see her. She's so good in this movie. And, uh, but when she came to the party, she, she'd like gone through a transformation. I didn't know it was the same actress, so I mean, I didn't know where to go to take the picture with her, but I do want to give her a shout out because I think she's incredible in the movie. She is. Well, let's take a look at the scene. I think we're gonna look at the scene with the snake first. So let's look at that. So you decided to use a real snake. Well, um, is that your idea, David, or was it? No next? way, dude. Yeah, was, yeah, okay. The the thing is, uh, when you when you make a movie, an actor has to be relaxed. There's always going to be a little bit of adrenaline there to push you into that zone, and that's good. But it can't get in the wrong direction. Uh, it was a big scene, it was a four-page scene, it was the introduction between Joe and, and Gary, and the adrenaline for me, because of the importance of the scene, was starting to go in the wrong direction. I knew from doing adventure films that one of the things that relaxes me uh, are stunts. I'm also someone that likes to drink a lot of coffee to relax, it actually calms me down. Uh, so when I, when I found that they had an actual venomous cottonmouth snake on the set, I, with, with big fangs uh, that could kill me. Uh, I said, David, would you please let me hold that snake? And he said, well, well, you know, well why do you want to do that? And he said, I said, well, because it'll relax me. And there was a pause there, and then he said to the snake wrangler, are you okay with Nick doing this? And the snake wrangler said, absolutely not okay with Nick doing this. This is not <laughs> a good idea. And David said, would you promise? Because he really loved the fangs, because you can see those are real... I mean, it wasn't, the other snake didn't have that. 
He said, well, I love the fangs, but you got to promise me, promise me, promise me that you're not going to die. Well, what I didn't tell David was that I had seen a picture in a book, didn't read the book, about handling venomous snakes. But it was a picture of a man holding the snake behind his head, and I recalled the picture, and I said, well, yeah, I think I can do this, and uh, I think we're, it's going to be fine, and l l let's go for it. And uh, so that's how it happened. The challenge was... I surfed the adrenaline, getting the snake up into my hands, and then as I got it into my hands, I started to relax, and I was able to do the dialogue. But the challenge was I had to turn the head of the snake in such a way that it didn't spit venom in Ty's face, because I, I wouldn't be able to live with that. And then, and then I had to hold it a little further to that side so the camera could get the fangs. And then I had to toss him gently, because I did like the snake, so I tossed him gently <laughs> into the grass, but I had to toss him in such a way that he wasn't going to turn around and reverse himself in midair and bite me on my neck and kill me. Needless to say, I was quite relieved when that scene was done. <laughs> it, it sounds like the scene then that relaxed you so well made everyone else nervous wrecks. Yes, I think they would be jumping away from this. Uh, th this might be the story of my life. Right. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's amazing about, um, you know, w when the idea of, of Nick uh, came about for this project, well, I mean, certainly just such a diverse, eclectic resume. Uh, in, in my mind, he's the, only, he's the only movie star that's been the lead of, of, of action movies, of uh, uh, prestigious dramas, won Oscars, and, and, and big comedies that I love. And so the idea of bringing these kind of complexities to the character of Joe was really important. Um, but th what I what I really didn't expect is um, the dedication and bravery of, of an actor. You know, you, you, you kind of have a perception, um, you know, whatever. We read about movie stars' lives and everything's, but you don't really realize until you, to, you, you get to the location, you get on set, and you roll up your sleeves and say, okay, this is actually, yeah, the crew's only this big, we only have this many days, only this amount of money, um, and are you cool with it? And then when, when Nick just gives you that smile and says, let's dig in, like, you know you've got a really committed actor going in to create a, a, a truly unique character. Yeah, I'm still wondering about what I would be doing if I were very close to you while you tossed the snake, you know? <laughs> Luckily, those guys weren't around a lot of movies, you know? They you were, can hear the reaction, because yeah, when, can, they, when yeah. the snake is on the grass, yeah. again, they're, they're jumping back. I mean, they were, they're, it was a pretty spooky moment for everybody. I mean, they got scared. I, I was scared. It, it's not a scene you did in one take, Either is uh, it or did you? Well, we do a lot of a lot of the scenes. In I hope you do a two. lot. Yeah, one or two. Yeah, one, okay. Not yeah, too many. Right. I want I want to get into what Joe's job is in the movie, and there's another clip that talks about the trees and what you're doing to the trees, because to me that says a lot about what's going on in the movie in a whole other way. So can we roll that one? Sounds like the story of indie filmmaking, you know? <laughs> Do you want to know? Do you, uh, you think you're going to get it every Friday? I don't know. But I think we, I, I wanted a little more about what he's actually doing by poisoning the trees. What, that's an illegal activity. Well, well it, it's a little, little dicey. I don't know that it's exactly illegal, but the, the lumber companies, the large corporations aren't allowed to uh, tear up some of these forests unless the trees are dead. And so they kind of just nod at a, at a crew of people that are a little bit more under the radar that can come in there and juice the trees and basically poison the trees, and then they're dead, and then the lumber companies the, um, can come in and point to them and say, look at all the dead trees. Uh, and then, they, then they're then they legally allowed to... to replant. Yeah. Yeah, and do all that. But I did, I did think that the, the action of poisoning trees, uh, whether Joe knew it or not, consciously that subconsciously karmically if you will it would have some kind of an effect on his psyche I mean, it's not the nicest thing to do to poison trees no even if there's a happy ending for them in the end he's still he's conflicted through the whole movie what we saw in a little bit of the trailer it's i know what makes me feel alive i know what keeps me alive i know so just for you as an actor doing this, what was the main attraction for you to play him? The, the main attraction really, um, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but the main attraction was that I felt that I understood him and his need for restraint and that I could take the wisdom of the so-called mistakes of my past and put them 
emotionally into the vessel of the character that is, is Joe. I felt like I could deliver his dialogue and the, the situations he found himself in and mean it. I didn't want to put things on top. I didn't want to go operatic in design with film performance or Baroque. I, I wanted to take things off and be as naked emotionally as possible, and Joe gave me a chance to do that. Well, you don't approach any of the movies you do uh, with timidity. At least that's not how it comes across. Some people say it's over the top. <clears throat> you say it's um, outside the box. Well, I, yeah, that's one of my favorite yeah. expressions. Or I'll say, you know, you show me where the top is, and then I'll tell you whether or not I'm over it. Um, I, I, I try to give every character, whatever the genre may be, 100%. I'm still the same actor, it's just that I wanted to experiment with the format of film performance. I was a big believer in art synthesis, meaning what you can do in painting or what you can do in music, why can't you therefore do it in, in film performance? And so I was just trying to open some doors for myself and hopefully for other actors that want to go outside the box and do it in big genre pictures or do it in smaller pictures or not do it, but just open up the range a little bit. What is it like to direct Nicolas Cage? Um, how do you do it? How do you do it? Uh, you know, I, I, I had the, the good fortune of, um, of an actor that was enthusiastic about the, enough about the project to come out significantly before, prior to production, begin not necessarily a formal or traditional rehearsal process, but expose himself to the location, get to know the cast, get to know me. And I think that's one of the most valuable tools for a director is to really have a have, have the actor trust you, uh, to spend time with them, know that you're out for each other's best interest. We're going to design something that, guess what, it's going to, you know, we're going to make the, we're going to make the hell out of this movie and we're going to go to the Apple store and talk about it. It's going to be great. <laughs> that and, was it. Uh, and, and, and to be able to, to have the commitment of the actor. I got to know Nick in, in, in a way that, um, you know, felt, felt like he was exposing himself in a way that it was inviting uh, some of the undercurrents of his true character into our character. There's a lot of lines in the movie where um, I was like, Nick, what was that story you were telling to Ty? Remember when we were driving around looking for locations that day and you were talking about this cool face that you made? And he's like, oh yeah, the cool face. So then we work his cool face monologue into, into a sequence in the movie. Or, you know, or Nick brings the idea of if he has this lighter that makes this specific sound, then maybe that's a gift that he can give the young boy. And so really bringing the collaborative efforts, efforts to to the process, not just being a director with my screenplay, you should say every word like this and hit your mark, and now we're gonna do the same thing in a close-up. This, this is a very um, loose and playful process. One of the things I wanna add to that, because it is worth mentioning for aspiring filmmakers, one of the things that I really enjoyed about working with David was, you know, he'll shoot the scene the way it's written, and then he'll shoot the scene with like an anything goes, like let's go to the improvisation there and see what we get so there's like an electricity or a spontaneity. And then he'll go back and say, let's do it one more time and let's not say anything. And a great example of that is if you, at the end with AJ, the guy who plays the chief of police, he asks me why do you want to go back to the penitentiary and I, I don't give him a dialogue, I don't give him a line, but it's, I almost do and I'm not gonna say anything, but you see it in the eyes. That is so, um, uh, it adds so much texture and variety to the performance, and this is really the first time I ever had that experience, really? working w w with David to do it three different ways, and I think that's enormously valuable for performance. Do you have anything to do with the editing of the movie while oh, David's no, no, doing it? Oh no, no, that's not just my. Stay out that's of that not my completely. department at all. Thank I stay you. out of that. Okay. Yeah, I might get my heart broken if I go in there. It is funny, though. We, we premiered the movie uh, in Venice in August, and I uh, sat next to Nick, and he hadn't, he hadn't seen anything. No dailies, no, edit, no rough cuts or anything. And so I just tried to keep creeping out of the corner of my eye to watch him watch the movie. It was pretty awesome. I think it would be nerve-wracking. Maybe not as much as the cotton mouth, but close. Well, those are the kind of anxieties that, you know, Nick likes holding snakes. I like, I like just the strange, like, uh, I like to surf emotions, not necessarily the physical dangers that he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but both have their dangerous side. All right, the last clip that we have to show is about the troubles that Joe has. So let's look at that, and then we'll get the audience to. All right, before I turn it over to the audience, I just want to ask each of you about, David is in the editing room, so he's watching this over and over and over and over again. And I don't know how many times you watch a movie 
that you're in, whether you see it and then it's over or whether you go back to them or not? Well, uh, I'm very happy with the results on this movie, and I've seen it with different audiences, different parts of the world, so that was a, a pleasure for me. Uh, by and large, though, uh, once I'm done, I, I don't go back. I try to look forward and, and keep going forward. I don't want to, because I don't want to get tr uh, trapped in any style. So that's that. Um, I'm very excited about this film, though. I, I see the movie as a, an ode to those people that we sometimes meet in life that give a person, a child or a young person, a chance. They see their potential and they encourage it, unlike the abusive father that sees the potential as a threat or a spotlight on their own inabilities, which leads to abuse. And it could be a science teacher, a math teacher, a cop, you know, like the work your wife does. I mean, these are angels that empower. The, 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 the concept of a father is to empower their child. It doesn't have to be blood. It can be someone that you've worked with or met. And that's what I think this movie is an ode to for me. Well, David, when you look at the movie, as you've seen so many times, what's the thing that resonates about Nick's performance for you? Is there a moment? Is there even an image? Doesn't, I'm not saying this is the big scene in the movie, this is anything, but something that resonates for you personally about what he did. You know, to me, and, and a lot of this is just having gotten to know Nick, is just seeing the honesty of himself in a role. You know, we, we, we've, we've all seen great actors in great performances, some of which are, are so far away from who they are humanly. Um, but this, it's, it's, you'll just see little moments in the movie, just a little look in the eye or the way he wakes up in the morning or, or feeds his dog, and you'll think, oh, that's Nick. And, and it, it feels, for me, one of the great prides of the movie is not only the authenticity of, of casting real people, and I know it's something that's fun to write about and certainly, hopefully, eye-opening to an audience, but, but to work with someone that knows a true craft and it can engineer characters so well and then can strip it all away and become a vulnerable human being in front of a camera is a, is a beautiful thing. Well, there, is, there are scenes in this movie with you and this dog that I don't want to do spoilers or anything, but they're kind of extraordinary about, it's another little love story going on in there. Absolutely. And the yeah. same thing with the violence and where it comes from and how it's protective sometimes. As, and not just this explosion. Anyway, enough of me. Let's have some questions from the audience. Hi, Nick. My name's Evan. Uh, what was your experience like in National Treasure? And what is Zachary Gordon like from your point of view? And is there going to be a National Treasure 3? And if yes, when is it going to start filming? Uh, well, hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, I... Uh, I I had a great time working on both National Treasures 1 and 2. Uh, I, I think those movies made a lot of people happy. I, I think, and while they made a lot of people happy in, a, in an entertaining way, they also uh, had a lot to say about American history, which is always a good thing to share with young people. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a National Treasure 3, uh, because, because the National Treasure scripts, unlike the Pirates scripts, that delve in fantasy, and you can write pretty much whatever you want. Um, National Treasure scripts, you have to stay historically authentic. You have to stay accurate. And to make that work, a lot of time and a lot of research has to go into tracking all of the scenes in a way that you can look up in your history book and see that actually did happen. So it's been a big delay. Over here. Hi. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming, guys. My name is Ben. Um, so, Mr. Green, I know as of late you've been working uh, a lot on large-scale comedies, and Mr. Cage, I know you've been doing a number of action films, and they're all really wonderful. And I'm just wondering, when you work on a different kind of film like this, where it's kind of a tamer script uh, or story, and you know, you're in the South in a small town, does that have an effect on you in terms of, like this is a kind of movie I would love to do again. Do you, do you see yourselves returning to this kind of a film? Uh, I think so. I, I, this, is, this was my ninth film, and, and I've tried to have a, a, a diverse experience with every film. Uh, I like to, you know, just as Nick, I really identify with Nick because we're so curious about different forms of filmmaking, um, be it performance or directing or, or writing. Uh, one of the things that's really fun for me over the last few years is I've been able to, to balance um, smaller, more dramatically based independent films with, uh, I, I direct the uh, 
several episodes of that HBO series Eastbound and Down. So I can go be as absurd and crazy and funny and ridiculous as I want on that show and then put a little bit more sensitivity, passion, and dramatic intensity into work like Joe or Prince Avalanche. Uh, just finished another one. You know, it's, it's been nice to be able to kind of leapfrog uh, back and forth from genre because just as much as an audience doesn't want to go see you know, a, a, a dramatic or a comedic or a horror film every week. We want to shake it up and see something different and entertain ourselves. That's really how I look at my career. I think Joe is um, a special movie. It's a unique film, uh, kind of a one-off. I mean, I've never seen a movie like it before, so I don't know that I'll be able to make another movie like it again, but I do know that I, I like working in David's world and going to Austin and working with his crew and walking around his vision. I uh, certainly uh, would like to have another experience like that. I do see myself as a student. I would never call myself a maestro. I'm not going for grades. I'm going for an education, and that means I have to try everything, be eclectic, take chances in different genres. Aaliyah Kazan once said in his book, A Life, talent never dies. It can be discouraged, remember that, but it never dies. Um, <laughs> You, you can't judge a book by its cover. Just because a movie has the label of adventure film, I like to call them adventure films, not action movie, but that's okay. Um, it doesn't mean that the actors involved still aren't giving it 100% and trying to fit the format of the style or the genre or try to do something new with the genre. So I often say, like, if you took 100-point wine and you put it in a bottle and the label was Bozo Wine, I don't think the top wine enthusiasts would know that it was 100-point wine because they wouldn't be able to get past the label. So I'm just saying open your minds a little bit and give every movie, whatever the genre may be, a chance. Good evening, Mr. Cage. My name is Sherry. Um, the movie seems to be at times emotionally wrenching. What scene was the most difficult and gut-wrenching for you to perform? Well, I, I have to be... 100% honest with you, uh, nothing was like gut-wrenching. It was a, it, there was a positive light on the set. It was a playful energy. Um, it, I, the, the most demanding in terms of, you know, trying to get in check with myself was going back to the experience I had with the snake and trying to surf those feelings of adrenaline and, and get back in balance to play the scene. But by and large, all the scenes we had, there, there was a joyousness going on. Even the dog fight, they were, those dogs were playing, you know, and, the, and then David put growls over it. But there, there, David uh, invites uh, 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 an experience on the set where you feel liberated and you feel like you can get to the truth of a character and improvise, and that's a joyous experience. You won Oscar, but the congratulations. You were wonderful in living in Las Vegas. Thank you. Then where do you keep the Oscar statue? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have any awards in my home. <clears throat> I don't like to look back. I like to look, look forward and up. So there are no totems to myself. I don't worship at the altar of myself. There are no, no awards in my house. The, uh, let me just say that they're safe, but they're not in my house. <laughs> Maybe for future generations of coplas and cages, they okay. can have them. Okay? This is my second question. Uh, I heard you run Japanese. I'm Japanese. So, konnichiwa. Konnichiwa, Nikolo-san. Konbanwa. Oshigoto, ganbatte kudasai. I'll write a poem for you right now. Uh, Shiro Yama Ishiaka. Thank you. Right. Domo, domo arigato, Thank Mr. You. Roboto. <laughs> domo arigato. Hi, I have a question for both Mr. Green and Mr. Cage. Uh, Mr. Green, it seems like there's a big shift in casting to uh, more non-traditional casting. Could you speak a bit more about the difficulty of the process post-street scouting to actually placing people in roles? Uh, the difficulty in, in sca uh, casting, uh, street casting, uh, as it's sometimes known. Um, difficulty, I don't really, I haven't really found much difficulty. You know, sometimes there's, with, without formal training, there's certain things like, you know, when to start acting, you know, like uh, some people uh, don't necessarily know the, the um, y you know, kind of the formalities of film acting, but then that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something specific. If I cast someone uh, that doesn't have formal training, I obviously see something in it. Sometimes it's just a, a great charisma. Sometimes it's, um, they're just incredibly confident and I find that funny or cool. And sometimes they just got to screw loose and I want to, uh, I want to see what's going on inside. 
Um, but I, I've never had a, I've never really regretted, I've never really had a regret of doing it. You know, sometimes people uh, are, are far more uh, self-conscious in front of a camera, but I really try to, to filter that in, in my process. The, uh, I flew out a month in advance to Austin and I met these people, uh, the predominantly African-American crew that I was working with. We got to spend time together and tell stories with each other. And, and so that by the time we went to action, there was a flow to the relationship like we had been together for years already. And then with Gary Poulter, I met him in a coffee shop with David and I, I knew right away I liked him. And, and he had real charisma and also he could recite the uh, Vincent Price uh, Black Widow monologue from Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare album. And I, I really wish that was in the movie, but he has his reasons and in the movie I love, so. But I mean, that was a great performance. And maybe it'll be in the outtakes. Hi. Hi. First of all, I just want to say that one of the earliest movies that I saw was National Treasure. And it just, like, when I, when I think of one of the first movies I ever saw, it was that, and it just it blew my mind. So just thank, you. thank you for making such great movies. Thanks for watching. <laughs> and I was just wondering, um, my friend who works at Marvel told me that, that you chose your, your, your screen name, Nicolas Cage, based off of the classic Marvel hero. Um, strong man, Luke Cage. Is that Power true? Man, yeah. True story. Well, I I I was um, studying in in elementary school um, music, and uh, also reading comic books, and those two experienced together. There was a collision between Luke Cage, Power Man, and John Cage, the avant garde composer. And I was saying to myself when I was trying to find my new name in my my surrealist name, if you will. I wanted something simple, but memorable and exotic. And it's actually an English name, but it had kind of an American ring to it. I thought of Luke Cage, and I thought of John Cage, and I thought of Nicolas Cage. Thank you. And now, um, my mom also had a, ha had, had a question for you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm very glad to meet you. Um, what my question was, it seemed very clear from listening that you really put yourself very deeply into this movie. Therefore, when you go and you watch it, do you find it almost some difficulty in watching yourself in the movie? Um, no, no, because, uh, because I, I had great experiences watching the movie. I went with my oldest son recently to a screen in LA and his response to it and the way he responded to the other folks in the audience, he said it, everybody left the building, they were transported and it just meant so much to me. So anything I can do to, to bring some joy to my family or even to myself, it, it's not gonna be difficult to watch. Hi guys, I, I appreciate your time today. So my question is around the characterization of Joe. So first to uh, Mr. Green about you know adapting from the book and what type of things you wanted to pull through into the screenplay. And then for Mr. Cage, specific influences that you drew upon in your own life and other characters that you met along the way that really rounded out the character. <coughs> Uh, yeah, one of the one of the things that uh, appealed to me about doing this project is it, uh, uh, is obviously the the literature it's based on. Larry Brown was a novelist that I had the fortune of working on a documentary about his life. I was a production assistant. It was my first job out of film school, and it was directed by one of my college professors, Gary Hawkins. When Larry passed away, um, Gary informed me that he worked on an adaptation of Joe, uh, and knowing that Joe was such a personal work for Larry, it. it to me, it felt like coming full circle uh, from my very first uh, job and enthusiasm and, and the inspiration that Larry was early in my career to a point in my career where I could actually maybe sweet talk an actor like Nicolas Cage to being in a movie and, and getting a, a character with this depth and com complexity up and running. It just felt like the, the right time for me. I, mean, I think that I'd been trying to find places to, in movies to put some of my observations growing up. Like I used to watch... 
on back in, in the 70s, the Marlboro Man commercials. And this guy who was playing the Marlboro Man, this kind of tough cowboy, had this face that looked like a face of pain. I go, well, you look like, is that what cool is? You look like you're in pain and yet you're smiling. You're smiling through the pain. Is that the definition of cool? Is that the anatomy of a cool face? So I was trying to put that into a movie. So specifically that went into the movie where I'm teaching Gary, Ty Sheridan's character, how to make a cool face. And I, first you make a face of pain, now smile. If you all try it, it's kind of a funny thing to do. Make a face of pain, now smile. It's, it's funny. So that went in and then somebody once told me about the DuPont lighter, it was just absurd and completely politically incorrect, but if you, if you hit the DuPont lighter, it opens and it makes a ping, like ping, and it's like a mating call and the ladies just love it and they, they know you got money, you gotta get a DuPont lighter, and it was like ridiculous. But to me it made sense that Joe might try to express that absurdist wisdom to, to Ty Sheridan's character and help him in, as he becomes a man. I'm an aspiring actor, and you were once quoted, Nicholas, for saying that your acting style was, and forgive my pronunciation, Nuovo Shamanic? Shamanic? Nuovo Shamanic, yeah. Could you please explain what that means? Uh, right. Okay. How much time do we have? All right. Uh, nouveau is French for new, and shamanic is a very old word which describes... Um, and I, you know, going into flights of the imagination and coming up with answers, and I can't take credit for this. Um, Professor Brian Bates wrote a book called The Way of Weird, and he also wrote a book called The, the Way of the Actor. And he put forth the notion that all actors in modern cinema, whether they know it or not, are are basically doing the, exactly the same thing that the ancient shamans used to do in pre-Christian times. They, they, the, 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 the villagers would go to the medicine man or the shaman and they would express their concerns about whatever was happening in the village and then the shaman would go into a flight of the imagination and act it out and come up with answers. And he said that film actors today are doing the same thing. They just may not know it. It's an ancient word for a modern occupation. When you go to a movie, if you've got a, a drinking problem, let's say, and you see Leaving Las Vegas, and you look at Ben Sanderson go down this path of self-destruction with alcohol, it might give you an answer. Do you want to drink more? Do you not want to drink? And so it was just a, a very ancient way of describing a modern occupation. I think it's as simple as that. Okay, well, we all thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, David, for being thank you. with us. Thank you.